have you ever found yourself in a conversation with someone who is standing by you but is rather interested in the conversation that's happening next to you? Have you ever been with someone who isn't really with you? Their mind seems elsewhere. Have you ever been that person? I think I've definitely been both. Sometimes my mind is way off thinking about all there is to do or planning the next meal or wishing I looked like her or could run like they do or that I mustn't forget to pick up milk in Lidl. But I've also been with people who are looking around, perhaps not really engaged with me, not really listening because they're distracted or their mind is on other things. What do we feel in that instant? I know that I personally don't really like that feeling much and then I find it almost unbelievable that sometimes I behave that way too. But today we are going to be thinking about living the now, this very minute. We're going to be thinking that our best days are now, not those in the past, not those in the future, but are now. You know, the psalmist wrote, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This day, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but this day the Lord has given to us to live. And yet, amazingly, research and statistics tell us that 47% of our time, our minds are not the same place our feet are. 47% of our time that we're in a conversation with someone, our mind isn't fully engaged. 47% of the time, we're sitting in church or at dinner with our family or engaged with someone at work or talking to someone in the gym or in the middle of life group. Almost half our waking life, our mind is not fully engaged where the rest of our body is. I find that a frightening statistic. So perhaps I had better ask you, are you here right now or has your mind already wandered off? You see, in today's world, there are so many things to distract us. Our mobile phones, laptops, iPads, computers, in fact, anything with a screen. I wonder how many homes are there where couples or families sit down for a meal and rather than talk together about their day, someone reaches across for their phone. Or perhaps it's not the phone for you, but it's games, mind games. You see, my mind sometimes plays two games. And the first one is when then game. The one day when then I'm going to be happy. Perhaps you do that too. You know, when I've done this job, then I can, or when I retire, then I can, or when our children are married and settled, then I can, or when I get promoted, or when I have more money. And so many of us, we are literally going through life wishing away the current moment, wishing away what we have right in front of us. And I think God would say, don't miss what you have now, pursuing what you want later. And I think I also play the game, not the uh, when then game, but I often play the what if game. It's projecting into the future. What if this happens? What if I don't pass this test? What if I don't get that job? What if I'm ill? What if my hubby has a crash on the way home? What if this happens and what if the government and what if the economy and what if aliens attack and so on and so on we go. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, he said, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has its own worries. Jesus says, don't worry about what's coming. Don't worry about the what ifs. And what I love about Jesus is that he isn't anti-planning. He says, I'm not telling you not to plan for the future, but I'm telling you not to worry about the future. Don't worry about it. So let me ask you again, are you still here? Are you still with me? Well, by now, if you've been with us over the last two or three weeks, you'll know that we are, have been thinking about a better way. And Fiona helped us to think about whether we are happy with the person we are 
and David asked us if we were too busy for what mattered. And both of them talked about the importance of not just concentrating on the truth that Jesus taught, but also looking at the way that Jesus lived. Jesus knew who he was, and he was never too busy or hurried. So today I want to consider a third aspect of Jesus' life and how he lived, always in the moment. He always had time for the individual, even if they appeared in front of him while he was on his way somewhere else. He wasn't preoccupied. He didn't live with his head in the past or worrying about the future. And he modelled for us that our best days are now, because right now is the only moment that we can live. And he wants us to make the most of every opportunity. He wants us to live life to the full. And I want to suggest to you that it's really, really important to live in the moment, to live now. So let's take a look at Jesus's life and see what we can learn from his way. Jesus's first miracle was at a wedding. And if you don't know the context, it was an incredibly embarrassing moment for the host who had run out of wine. And Jesus's mother spoke to him about the problem. And nearby there were six stone water pots standing there and each held 20 to 30 gallons. If you want to get an idea of how much that is, that's about 1,440 pints or 1,108 bottles of wine today. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled to the brim, he said to them, dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So they followed his instructions. And when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, he called over the bridegroom. Usually the host serves the best wine first and then when everyone is full and doesn't really care, he brings out the less expensive wines. Now, I always thought that the next line said, but you saved the best for last. But that's not actually what God's word says. What God says is that, but you've saved the best till now. The best is now, especially if Jesus is involved. Now let's look at two back-to-back -back stories that illustrate Jesus' heart for the people right in front of him, being fully engaged in the moment. The first one Luke tells us about Jesus as he was walking into Jericho, this magnificent walled city. And if you can imagine, there were large crowds all around him and they were fighting for his attention. And as he was walking, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now the people around were offended. Jesus doesn't have time for this guy. Jesus is going somewhere. He's too important. He's too busy. Jesus has an agenda. Jesus can't stop for some guy who's begging on the side of the road. And people rebuked the blind beggar. But Jesus stopped. And despite all that was going on around him, he engaged with a single hurting person fully engaged in the moment. And in that moment, Jesus gave him all of his attention. And he said, what would you like me to do? And the man cries out, I want to see. And Jesus spoke a miraculous word of faith and healed the man. You know, one miracle was that Jesus healed him. But I think the second is that Jesus stopped for a guy that no one had time for, fully engaged with the person in front of him. Our second account is actually the consecutive story. It mentions Jericho again. As Jesus entered Jericho, and this time Luke tells us that he was actually going somewhere. He was passing through, so he was moving on. He had somewhere to be. And as Jesus entered Jericho, passing through, a man there was there by the name of Zacchaeus and he was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Now, if you notice, Jesus has already been interrupted one time by a poor blind beggar. Now he's interrupted by a rich corrupt tax collector. You know what I love about Jesus is that he's got time for the down and out 
and he's got time for the up and out. He's got time for anyone and a heart for everyone. It doesn't matter where you come from, how bad your baggage is, how dirty it is, how rich it is. Jesus cares about you. Jesus stops for this guy named Zacchaeus. Now, if you don't know who Zacchaeus was, I want to tell you about him. Zacchaeus was a very little man, and a very little man was he. He climbed up into the sycamore tree for the saviour he wanted to see. Anyone remember singing that in Sunday school? Well, he was a tax collector, which may not mean a whole lot to us in this culture, because a tax collector is, well, quite respectable. But during this time, this was like the most corrupt of all people. A tax collector wouldn't have been a person, would have been a person who would have charged you what you owed and then added to it an exorbitant amount and kept the difference for himself. So this was one of the most despised, most hated people around. And Jesus sees this guy and he calls him by name and then invites himself over for lunch. Jesus was going somewhere, and after he'd already been interrupted once, he gives a corrupt man his full attention. As Zacchaeus spends time with Jesus, he has this moment of deep repentance, and in the presence of the Son of God, he just says something like, oh, I've sinned so many times, I've hurt so many people, I am so sorry. I'll do anything I can to make it up. And then he says, I'll give half my possessions to the poor and I'll pay back four times um, to anyone that I stole from. And Jesus looks at this man and says, today, in this moment, right now, salvation has come to your home. Jesus had an undivided attention in the moment. And he stops and he gives people one of the greatest gifts that he can give, his attention and his love. Jesus was always fully present in the moment. And I want to be like that, but unfortunately I'm not. And I need to keep asking God to help me be engaged in whatever is in front of me. I want to be where my feet are. I want to not just live for the happy moments and the up moments and the powerful moments and perhaps the outwardly meaningful moments, but I want to be present in all moments even the annoying moments. I wonder how many of you are living in the middle of a lot of annoying moments right now. You know, some seasons of life are just more annoying than others. I remember when my boys were little and they seemed to want to play with every toy in the cupboard. And by the end of the day, the floor would be littered with Lego and train sets and marble runs and jigsaws and games. And I remember complaining because they weren't so good at tidying up and putting them all away. And I longed for the days when they would be less messy and more grown up. But then that time came and I kind of missed their little hands finding mine and pulling me down to play a game or build a lorry or make a model. I almost missed the muddle. And perhaps today you're complaining about moments you'll miss tomorrow. You're complaining about the moments right now that you're going to miss one day in the future. Jesus was fully engaged in the moment. And the only way to be fully present in the moment is to let go of a past that we can't change, no matter what we've done, and trust that God has it. And to surrender our future and trust that God is good, that he cares, that he's already there. And because he redeems the past and because he's good in the future, we can be fully engaged with the person or that which is before us in the present. It does take faith. It takes faith in God to engage in God's calling right in front of you. The way to be fully present in the moment is to surrender a past we cannot change and entrust a future that we cannot control to our loving and ever-present God. I love the way James phrases it. James was the half-brother of Jesus and he says, Come now, you who say, 
today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. <laughs> I mean, open your mouth sometime and breathe on glass and watch the mist come and then watch the mist fade away. That's our lives. The image that really gets me often is the hourglass. And I like to think about this. This is our life. We're here for a little while and the life that God has given us on this earth is passing away in the moment. And there's three things about this that are interesting to me. One is, well, partly apart from the fact that it's really scary how fast that sand is falling through. But the first thing is that no one knows how much sand is on the top. You think you do. But there's a lot of people who thought that there was a lot more than there really was. No one knows how much is on the top. The second thing is no matter what you do, you can't stop the sand from flowing. Time is passing and every day is a gift from God. Today is a gift from God and some of us are wishing it away. The third thing is once the sand is at the bottom, we can never get it back. And that's why it's so important to live in this moment, to make the most of our days, to make the most of every opportunity. If you're still here, if you're still with me, you need to know that you can't serve Jesus where you're not. You can't love people the way Jesus did where you're not. This is the day the Lord has made. The most important moment is right now. And the most important is the one right in front of you. We can live for the big moments and the special moments and the powerful moments. But the more we live for, for the now, we recognise that the most powerful moments are often the smallest moments. The most meaningful often aren't the mountaintop experiences, but the conversations that we share with someone that we love. This week, uh, Ronnie's flight got cancelled on Wednesday and he got to work from home. And so on a lunch break, we went for a short run and then had lunch together in the middle of the day. And we sat there and we watched a black cap and the long tailed ticks on the feeders and the bullfinches on the rowan tree. It was nothing big, but it was a real joy. I loved those moments, unrushed, unhurried and treasured. Please don't miss what you have now, pursuing what you want later. This is the day the Lord has made. And when you look at the way that Jesus lived, he walked along. People weren't interruptions or inconveniences. They were moments and opportunities to engage and show the goodness and the love of God. This moment, this moment is all you have. This moment. This moment matters. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty because... You know, I get distracted lots, but I'm working on it. And when you think about Jesus, if there was any time that he would have been distracted from others, if there was any time that he would have been consumed with himself, like we often are, it would have been on the cross. When you think about it, he is the sinless son of God and people stripped him and beat him so he didn't even look like a human being. They whipped and flogged him, so his back was left open and bleeding. Hanging on a cross, having to push up on his feet with nails through his ankles, pulling up on his wrists with nails through his wrists, just trying to get a breath as people cursed him and spat on him. And right next to him was a criminal who looked over at Jesus and had a conversation. And the guy said, well, something probably more than what's recorded, but probably something along the lines of, I've done a lot of bad things and I feel really bad about that and I am really, really sorry. But whatever he said, we know that he said this. He looked at Jesus and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And even in the midst of his suffering, the worst, the most painful moments of Jesus's life, 
he's fully engaged with a criminal across and looks over at him and says, today, today you will be with me in paradise. He was fully engaged even in that moment. You see, if our mind is not where our body is 47% of the time, we will be missing out on the life that God has given us. And the moment is right in front of you. You can't be a great friend where you're not. You can't be an engaged mum or dad if you're not there. You can't have a great marriage if you're not there. God has saved the best days for you now. Now, in this moment, you can experience his grace. Now in this moment, you can experience his mercy. Now in this moment, you could experience his forgiveness. Right now. His power is here. His love is here. His grace is here. All his goodness is here. He's with us. Can you sense it? In this holy moment, God is with us now. And God says, your best days are now. If you're fully engaged with the people that God brings in front of you, pouring out your heart in that moment, your best moment can be right now. Engage in the moment. Be where your feet are and see what God has put in front of you. And I promise you, his goodness, his grace, his love is better than you could imagine. And if you look for it in the moment, this is the day, this moment is the moment that the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. If you're still here, if you're still with me, let's pray. God, I know this is not something we can change on our own. I pray, Father, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would prompt us again and again. Would you drive this deep into our hearts and in our minds, when we drift from a conversation with a child, when our mind drifts from an intimate moment with a spouse, when our mind drifts away from what could be an opportunity to minister to someone and we're tempted to pick up a phone or worry about the past or obsess about the future. God, help us to surrender a past we cannot change and trust you with a future we cannot control and engage fully in the moment. We draw our minds to where we are so we can love people the way you loved us. Father, convict us, empower us, change us to be more like Jesus, to live the way that Jesus lived, fully engaged in the moment, showing your love in all we do. And as we keep in this moment, I want to just ask you to think about this. How are you doing with God? How are you doing in your walk with Jesus? Do you feel far from God or maybe guilty about something you've done? Let me just tell you about the goodness of God in this moment. You're here or you're watching because God wants you here and God wants you watching. He knew this moment would happen and he loved you enough to bring you to a place where he can speak into your heart. And here's what he wants you to know. He loves you right now. No matter what you've done in the past, he loves you. No matter what you're worried about in the future, he loves you. In this moment, and he shows you his love in the person of Jesus. And we're told, aren't we, that anyone who calls on his name, on the name of Jesus, will be saved. Sins will be forgiven. Not because we're good, but because he's good. We are told that we can be made new. Our past is gone and we can trust our future to him. In this moment, when you call on the name of Jesus, God hears your prayer. He's 100% with you. He's not distracted. He's not got his mind on anything else but you. And you can move from shame to freedom. You can move from wondering where you stand with God to a peace that goes beyond all understanding. 
this is the day. Your best days are now.